Thanks very much, Nick. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be involved in the, the conference. Uh, with uh, apologies to George Bernard Shaw, I'm going to try and tell you a story about uh, the discovery and development of the blood cytokines uh, at, uh, in Melbourne and mostly at the Walter and Eliza Hall and the um, uh, Ludwig Institute at the University of Melbourne. Um, the story starts in 1964 when Ray Bradley, who was working in the physiology department, worked through the, walked through the, the cloisters across Royal Parade, which is no more f small feat, especially for the visitors, I might add, um, <laughs> to the, the Walter and Eliza Hall to start a collaboration with Don Metcalf. They were both interested in cell biology, but uh, in those days, Metcalf wasn't actually in the main building he was at the back of the hospital, above the animal rooms, because the administrator of the hospital, uh, the, um, of the director of the Walter and Eliza Hall, Burnett, felt that immunology was more important than cancer research. So Don had a, uh, his own laboratory at the back. Uh, Ray walked over, um, and they started a collaboration based around Don's thymic engraftments and growing lymphocytes in different places in the mice. And their first collaboration was not about white blood cells, but it was about red blood cells. In fact, what they did, uh, Ray convinced Don to um, engraft some spleen under the kidney capsule, and instead of getting uh, more lymphocytes, they finished up growing erythroid cells under the, the kidney capsule. And although that wasn't the major um, aim of their experiments, they were both intrigued by what might have stimulated uh, the erythroid cells, and Ray was particularly interested in growing bone marrow cells in particular. So Ray went back and started to try to re repeat the growth of some of these um, myeloid cells in soft agar cultures in his uh, glass petri dishes back in the physiology department. And after an <clears throat> about a, a year experimenting, he walked across the road again with uh, a dish containing clones of bone marrow cells. This dish was fed by kidney embryonic feeder layers, the, the kidney that they'd used in vivo. He took the embryonic kidney and stimulated mouse bone marrow cells to form these colonies. Don Metcalf not only was excited, he was enchanted. In fact, it was his statement, this was the most beautiful picture that biology had ever uh, produced. In fact, even in science, and if you take perhaps uh, the deep, Hubble's deep space image, it might rival some of Metcalfe's colonies. <laughs> and he was able to go down and pick off a colony and have a look at it, and <clears throat> something the astronomers find difficult to do. Um, and he found that some of these had in fact horseshoe-shaped nuclei, and um, they were very reminiscent of neutrophils in the blood. And he interpreted the bone marrow colonies. They were vastly different. Some were dispersed, some were very tight. But he could see that some of them were neutrophils and others were macrophages. They weren't really quite as clean as macrophages as I've shown here. They were full of agar granules. So the interpretation wasn't as easy as you might think. And uh, they were a little reticent to call them macrophages in those days, and they actually used the term mononuclear cells in their paper. But they were, in fact, uh, macrophages filled with granules, and some of those were polymorphonucleosites. And um, they recognized that the kidney cell feeder layers may have been contributing erythropoietin, but maybe they were for, uh, also the source of this molecule called leukopoietin G, which never, ever raised its head again after 1965. And I'm not quite sure why that was, but uh, there was something coming from the kidney cells that produced the white blood cells uh, they didn't see red blood cells at that time. The same thing was happening actually in Rehovot in Israel. Um, uh, Leo Sachs was growing bone marrow colonies in soft agar, but he thought they were mast cells because of all these little granules of agar. So that was quickly corrected, and um, in fact, we started an era of hemopoietic progenitor cells. There was no doubt that they um, started this whole stem cell, progenitor cell, mature cell lineages. At the Walter and Isaac Hall at that time, there were a lot of young clinicians and scientists, and this is a, a young Bill Robinson, 
Bill Robinson remained a lifelong friend of uh, Don's and Bill uh, was charged with looking for other tissues that might produce bone marrow uh, colony stimulating factor. <laughs> and he looked at every possible tissue including human urine. Um, it wasn't, didn't matter if it was for men or women, Bill collected it in his own inimical way. Uh, <laughs> And uh, a lot of it stimulated quite good colonies in the dishes at those times. But it clearly wasn't going to be enough just to get small samples. And uh, Don had quite a good team of uh, young clinicians and scientists, uh, Malcolm Moore, Noel Warner, Richard Stanley were also part of the team. And so Bill Robinson set up a, a larger collection facility which <laughs> has its own story in many different ways. But uh, Richard Stanley, uh, filtered the urine, concentrated, dialyzed it, and started to try to purify it with what at those times were simple chromatography methods, but Richard had a flair for this. He chose the right sort of columns. He chose um, the right style of uh, purification techniques, even though he was a PhD student at the time. And some of the early experiments in 69, they were able to separate and assay the colony stimulating factors from the major proteins in urine, a lot of these are plasma proteins actually, um, and <clears throat> set about the tradition of purifying colony stimulating factors. But it was clear even by the early 70s they weren't going to get enough to get a structural analysis of this. So Don asked one of his students, John Sheridan, a new student about 1972, look for other tissues where we might be able to produce colony stimulating factor. And because the kidney cells actually produced a lot in vitro, I thought, well, well, let's take other tissues, put them in culture, and maybe they'll make even more. And John Sheridan uh, looked at a lot of different tissues, and one of the ones which made lots of colony stimulating factor were mouse lungs in uh, Del Beco's medium. And in fact, when he assayed these mouse lung condition medium, they turn out to be about 500 times as potent as some of the batches of human urinary CSF. So we started the, the, the notion that he should uh, purify those. And that's about when I entered the story. Um, I was uh, in Israel, a young theoretical chemist actually at the time, and I'd gone there to do a postdoc because we couldn't afford the computing time in New York. And um, the first night I was there, Leo Sachs was giving a, a talk. He said, uh, and I remember a theoretical chemist, but he said you take a purified protein, you put it on a cell, and it turns into blood cells. I thought, that sounds simple enough. <laughs> uh, and through one miracle or enough, and since I wanted to eat when I came back to Australia, I found that there was somebody in Australia, Don Metcalf, who was working on this. So I thought, I'll, you know, and I met him and came, we started work. And the day I came in, I said, how about some colony stimulating factor and we can start these cells differentiating. And he went out into the lab and came back with this tube. And in there with the lungs, he said, well, the CSF's in there. You've just got to get it out. <laughs> and and <clears throat> after talking to some of the postdocs and technicians, it was clear that one tube wasn't going to do the job. And maybe a few tubes weren't going to do the job. Even a thousand tubes was not going to give us enough. But we set about making large batches of this. In fact, a thousand uh, mice at a time. We finished up um, purifying it just in a similar way to Richard Stanley and Jim Carroll Macaris and I started the first purifications, which finished about four years later uh, with a purified uh, GM CSF on a gel. But uh, it wasn't enough to sequence. There was no gas phase sequences at the time. And what we could do, though, was working with uh, colleagues such as Greg Johnson and Catherine Jess Dress, study the biology of the purified molecule. And we know that it was stimulating multipotential cells. It stimulated the, the mature cells themselves, the neutrophils and the eosinophils and the macrophages, to actually function quite differently. But one of the things it didn't do was stimulate the mouse leukemia cells, which we had observed would differentiate if we put endotoxin serum and things like that on them, so that our GMCSF wasn't giving us all of the activities that we thought colony stimulating factors should have. So in the next couple of years, in fact, Don went on sabbatical and discovered multi-CSF in Switzerland, uh, where the one molecule appeared to give both erythroid colonies um, and white cell colonies. <coughs> 
Um, it was called multi-CSF by us for about 20 years, but uh, the immunologists always went out and uh, interleukin-3 is what it's called. <laughs> um, we also discovered the factor that stimulated those leukemic cells, GCSF, by a simple column technique, and um, that's what Nick came to work on uh, for most of his career. And uh, when he joined the lab, uh, his usual thorough, very hard-working uh, efforts produced uh, purified GCSF, again, some years later, but in fact, he was the first person in the world, I believe, to purify GCSF. It was a mouse GCSF, and we had some problems moving it forward. In fact, we were at a bit of a roadblock in 1979 because we couldn't produce enough of the molecule uh, to sequence. We could use it, but we couldn't use it in vivo. And Don would say that we'll never have enough. Um, we just have to get on with life. But some things happen. And as you remember, genetic engineering came to the fore. And people started to produce lots of proteins in bacteria. It's just that we didn't have any genetic engineers. And we didn't have any laboratories. Um, but our director, Gus Nossel, who's the most charismatic person I've ever met, and had an ability to attract people and money to the institute, had been talking to another organization about establishing a major facility in Australia. And Gus told me on one very late winter's night I should go up to this tea room where there are no lights on, totally dark, and meet one of the Ludwig Institute um, administrators at the time, Hugh Butt. In fact, there were three people in the room, Hugh Butt, Jack Barry, and Don, Donald Park, all very intimidating people, but they convinced me that if I agreed to uh, work on colon cancer, that they would support us to set up a genetic engineering facility and run the Ludwig Institute in Melbourne. And, and that was a very successful collaboration between Walter and Eliza Hall and the University of Melbourne's Department of Surgery. And we did set up uh, the ability to attract molecular biologists and give them the facilities to participate in genetic engineering. And Ashley Dunn actually had been at um, Cold Spring Harbor and EMBL. It came to Melbourne to set up our molecular biology facilities and he attracted Nick Goff to come and do the first cloning for us. And another thing happened at the same time. Despite a lot of people's cynicism, protein sequencing improved dramatically. Leroy Hood and Michael Hunkerpilla were able to sequence much, much smaller amounts of protein. And now uh, protein sequencing in, uh, opportunities improved dramatically. And although CSIRO was not allowed to work on medical research, Lindsay Sparrow and CSIRO up the road after hours uh, took our condition medium through the final paces and we were able to produce enough GMCSF together to allow them to sequence and then for Nick to provide um, uh, the first CDNA, cDNA clones a few years later. That clone um, led to uh, the ability to extract the messenger RNA and Don was able to assay uh, the recombinant GMCSF for, uh, which had been um, enriched from the clones. In fact, this was one of his first non-agar hemopoietic assays. Nick and I have been able to pur purify liver progenitor cells, so these could all be done in microassays, and one phroglobocyte was able to produce enough for us to, to assay at the time. And he produced neutrophils and macrophages from that recombinant material, and we essentially never looked back. The, the teams were large, and we had a lot of uh, help, and. Um, uh, Nick Goff, Diane Grail, Ed Neese, Jill Goff and Lindsay were all part of the purification um, and cloning team and um, Don's team with uh, Luber, Annette, Yvonne, Nick and Kelso and Kathy Quittlesey were really necessary for all of the biological studies that we were doing. And I think we did a, a, a good job. The laboratory bed to bedside is another story, and, and I don't have time to go through a lot of the details or many machinations, but we did actually patent the mammalian sequences and provide, despite the complete lack of interest in Australia, um, an American company, Sharing Power, licensed uh, our clone 
They also then set up a court action to try and knock the clone down for 12 years, but the license <coughs> actually worked. And we had a, a deal signed and the uh, clinical development started. But um, whilst that clinical development was underway, uh, Ashley had been creating knock-in mice with Richard Lang, and the first one we did was a GMCSF knock-in mice. And these mice had some various inflammatory responses, including one in the iron. Don insisted that um, it be published under the title of Transgenic Mice Expressing GMCS Were Blind and that there was a fatal tissue damage. Not the best thing to do before you go into your clinical trial. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be um, outdone, uh, we, we are actually able to start off a clinical unit at the Ludwig in conjunction with the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Weihai. And that was headed up by one of the most charismatic young clinicians. He did his PhD with Don. He went to um, NCI and Bethesda. And George Morstan came back and started to set up the infrastructure for us to run the clinical trials. And George attracted many young clinician scientists to do their PhDs or work in the hospital and to take these things from the bedside into the clinic. Jonathan Sabon, Graham Liskey, Glenn Begley, Bill Sheridan and Daryl Ma were some of the fellows that worked in the hospital and the lab together. They not only made wonderful clinical observations, they produced uh, excellent biology in the lab. And there was a lot of information coming back from the bedside to the clinic at the time. And, and one of the very important uh, observations, and I'm, I've just listed a few of their observations about the first dose effects and the ability of these to increase neutrophils and to protect patients and um, reduce infections. But one of the experiments I remember very clearly was that one day I saw George, and George is quite an imposing person, walking across between the Royal Melbourne Hospital and our labs with a tube of blood clutched in his hand. And then I realised in later years that was the first time someone had a, some blood with uh, peripheral blood mobilised stem cells in it. And early Dursen had cultured these and they found that the cytokine led to a rush of blood into the periphery as stem cells into the periphery and they could be used instead of transplantation and made a big difference to the clinic. Now, there are many other stories and cytokines discoveries from Weihai and I'm just going to finish with a few minutes um, highlighting the fact that it didn't finish in the 90s, that uh, there's been lots of interesting uh, stories since. Um, leukemia inhibitory factor, David Gearing and Nick Goff uh, did the cloning with uh, Doug Hilton and Ann Kelso. In fact, uh, they produced the original clone for the lift and it didn't go as smoothly as GMCSF. When they put it into bacteria and then assayed it, completely dead. Absolutely no activity and uh, sitting around scratching their head for some time until Richard Simpson, who had actually done the sequencing for them, noticed their clone didn't have the C-terminal section and they were able to stitch that on and all of a sudden the leukemia inhibitory activity came back and LIF is a story, a very major success story for Australian science. Francesca Walker and I found um, evidence for the GMCSF receptor in mice and uh, Nick uh, Nicola then said about an expression cloning of the receptor. He could detect the receptor on cos cells transfected into a library and then was able to isolate the clone and prove the human GMCSF receptor and its chain structure and led to a whole uh, biochemistry of cytokine activation. Warren Alexander uh, produced a number of mice in the same way as uh, Ashley had knocked in some of the cytokines. Warren was manipulating the megakaryocyte uh, thrombopoietin receptor uh, both activating it and inhibiting it and showed that the amipal uh, protein on the surface was responsible for platelet production, but also that it altered the stem cells um, in mice so that these cytokines weren't just <coughs> acting on the progenitor cells but had effects on um, the uh, early cells. And that tradition's been continued with um, Kylie Mason and Ben Kyle working on platelet lifespan and some of the apoptosis, pro-survival pro molecules showing that platelets, even though they've got no nucleus, 
their survival depends on the same sort of systems that allow uh, the proliferating mammalian cells to survive. <coughs> the um, discovery of the SOX genes, I could stop now and not talk about Doug Hilton's material. <laughs> But, uh, uh, <laughs> the um, discovery of the feedback inhibitors for cytokine signaling. Doug was in Boston working on a lithium poison receptor. He came back as an independent, very creative investigator who decided he wanted to see if something might inhibit cytokine signaling. And he conceived this screen with a retroviral library that would take cells which were responsive to cytokines and then would make them unresponsive, something I avoided most of my life for uh, inhibitors. But he found that one genetic clone in this retroviral library that suppressed cytokine signaling, and the whole field of cytokine intracellular signaling, when you combined it with the JAK kinases, we had a much deeper experience of what was going on. And that continues today. The Institute is interested in cytokine activation and in, uh, inhibition. Nadia Kershaw and Jeff Babin are looking at the interaction between the SOX molecule and the, um, sorry, uh, and uh, the SOX molecule and the JAK kinases, and they're able to see actually the, I think I can do this. No, I don't think I can do that. Um, they can see the site where SOX interacts with JAK and designing ways in which to interfere with JAK in, uh, activation for anti-inflammatory responses. So hemopoiesis research continues at the Institute very strongly. There are many promising, exciting clinical applications in personalized medicine that are going to move into the future. It's been a, a great run. I can't finish the seminar without actually saying that, uh, that I'd like to remember Don's dedication and talent and creativity in recognizing those first colonies, attracting so many people to work with him over many years and making such a difference to hemopoiesis research throughout the world. He was a very good friend and uh, creative scholar at the Institute. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>